on Soft Gold, WHAV. That's the wave! Melinda's Garden Moments help gardeners create and maintain a healthy, beautiful garden with ease, inside or out, and all year long. This is Melinda Myers, inviting you to tune in every weekday morning, right here on WHAV. You'll learn creative ways to grow your own vegetables and herbs while beautifying your landscape. Eco-friendly lawn care, flower garden design basics, unique container gardens, attracting birds and butterflies to the landscape, and much more. Again, please join me weekday mornings for Melinda's Garden Moment for a very environmentally friendly approach to gardening. Remember, only local radio can bring you this feature opportunity, but only WHAV does. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with wave weather. Cloudy for tonight with periods of rain. Initially temperatures in the 40s, then rising a bit perhaps overnight. During the day Tuesday, mostly cloudy, breezy, and milder into the 60s with a few scattered showers around. Slight chance at some thunder as well. Maybe a few showers Tuesday night back in the low to mid 40s. And for Wednesday, partly sunny. Chance of a shower. Temperatures near or just a bit over 60. I'm Gary Best. Your next wave weather in 30 minutes. W-H-A-V. Open mic. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHA presents offer the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. History. Make your voice heard. Call 978 and direction. That's 978-374-19. You can stand with the local militia to face the British regular at sunrise on what am I hearing? Sunday the 9th. 
if you are if you are the oldest it's not here who died Ladies and gentlemen, Massachusetts Avenue across Cary Library. Ninety minute trolley tour of the historic Battle Road. Tickets required all right uh ladies and gentlemen i was kind of a a very sorry state of affairs starting the program it looks like uh haverhill community television uh does no longer serve the public interest uh, it's decided that today it would take the day off i know it's a holiday for some uh, but not for those in public information apologize for the delay in starting the program uh, running our new feed to Facebook. I'm Tim Coco, your host of the Open Mic Show. Tonight, uh, we'll take your phone calls, largely open lines. Let me tell you first how and where to listen. You can watch and listen on Facebook. Go to WHAV's page on Facebook. You'll be able to watch and listen there. You can go to WHAV.TV. And you can watch and listen there. Apparently, you cannot watch and listen to Channel 22. Last week, some bizarre excuse about rewiring. This week, eh, what the hell? Public service is not important to Haverhill Community Television. All right. Uh, on the air, whav.net, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, on tonight's program, besides your calls, questions, and comments, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mysteries at the museum. Uh, thanks to our good friend David Godswood, open mic show historian, uh, almost a million people learned about Haverhill's Duncan McDougall, the man who weighed souls. Uh, David Godswood's story first appeared on WHAV's Wavelengths newsletter and on uh, the news website at whav.net. And um, we're going to have some screen captures, and we'll tell a little more of that story. We'll also tell you who's been contributing to WHAV's Make Waves campaign. And um, in case you're wondering, and maybe, maybe it wouldn't bother you or not, but the city of Haverhill's website's been down all day since this morning. Most popular city web pages, such as the mayor's office, city clerk, treasurer and tax collector, water and wastewater, and other pages at the city's website were not available at least as late as 6 o'clock. Maybe someone can tell me if they see something. Uh, the Haverhill Public Schools website uh, was working. It uses a different domain name, if that makes a difference. Website access became more important to residents and businesses today as City Hall was closed because of the Patriots' Day holiday because the day off city personnel were unavailable for comment all right uh, some news today also uh, rather surprisingly but before we get into that let me tell you this hour of the open mic show is being brought to you by Haverhill Bank just one bank all right um, some calls are coming in now. Why don't I bring you up to date on WHAV's Make Waves campaign, Bring Local News to FM. Let me tell you about that. 
are about 4% raised from the general public so far. We'd certainly like to improve on that. The more formal campaign begins shortly. But let me tell you, in reverse order, who has been contributing lately. I'm very, very pleased. Matt Pereira who was an intern here from Northern Essex Community College. He is the latest contributor. Uh, City Councilor, former Mayor Bill Ryan and his wife Maureen. David Goudsward, you know, he does so much for us as it is, and he contributed. Eva Rasek contributed. Ken Bernard, now many of you... um, Ken is a man, was a manufacturer, now living in Florida with his son-in-law and his daughter, uh, David Goswood, and his, uh, Heather, uh, in Florida. Ken uh, stepped forward. Uh, Thomas and Katina Mortimer contributed. Kendall and Evelyn Smith. Donna Halper, the famous radio historian. Alvinza Hansen. Gregory and Joan Caleri. Had an anonymous one in here as well. Uh, Two anonymous ones here. Uh, Also, Michael Labonte, Connie Corr, Jay McDonough, Stan Colton, Fred Simmons, Carolyn and Charles Russell, Patricia Johnson, whose uh, late husband, Ed Johnson, is uh, who's for whom this room is named, the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom. Uh, Joseph Edwards, Attorney Joseph Edwards, Chairman of the Haverhill License Commission, former Chairman of the Board at Northern Essex Community College. Mary O'Neill, another one from uh, Eva Rasek, thank you. Gerald McCall, our uh, open mic show environmental expert. WXBJ Radio of Salisbury. Gene Poth, Larry Seaman, you remember him from uh, uh, Around Town, Elaine Barker, Larry Olasky, Mark LeMay, another WHAV alum, Dave Tibbetts, who's a uh, whose nonprofit organization sponsors us in the next hour, Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council, uh, Jessica Finicaro, member of the... Um, uh, Greater Lawrence uh, Vocational Technical School Board. Tom Bergeron himself got his start at WHA. Jack Al Brenner. Al Brenner kicked off the uh, public fun campaign. Is that a call? All right, you are on the open mic. So may one safely assume that the television. Uh, well, somehow you think they're related. Not. I have to. Oh, all right. Yeah. I'm a- well, it went down around 10 this morning. Um, and, of course, one reason WHAV was looking at it is because the city council agenda was there. Luckily, we got what we needed from it uh, before the site came down. Because of the holiday, I'm going to have to assume no one is working, and therefore no one is going to fix it. Uh, well, I, I, did manage, I did go into the HUSIS, which is the uh, data information on the registration, and just to see if it was something stupid like they let it expire. And it, it's uh, it's uh, kind of interesting. The uh, registration name, of course, is John J. Guerin, who is the chairman of the selectmen, according to this. So that's how old the information is on this website, registration data. Wow, John, you're uh, chairman of the selectmen when you started this website. Well, congratulations. Uh, obviously yeah. not your fault, John. Um, not, not yet. Well, we'll find a way. It's, it's America. The... Uh, other contact, I don't even recognize. It's a Methuen address. Uh, actually, it's a city of Methuen address. Now, you're Kingsley finding this Lough. under the registration King- information? Kingsley Loft, I guess, is the name. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't recognize it, but I don't live there anymore. All right. Did you uh, catch the start of this program? <laughs> uh, well, if you want to call it that, I suppose. All right, yeah, well... Lots of uh, lots of technical problems these days, um, but we are streaming to um, Facebook. I hope. 
Maybe someone will confirm that later. That's a new feature, but it takes a little bit to get this to, to run sometimes. And, I'll take uh, your word for it. I go in the old-fashioned way. And then um, someone earlier today plugged something in back here. It took me a while to figure out what it was and shut it off. Uh, then, um, <laughs> so, uh, the show gets off to a great start, and of course we're waiting for Haverhill Community Television to put us on. Now, if I recall correctly, and I think Nate was here so he can help me with this, two years ago, on this very day, uh, we were on the air live because we reported the results of the marathon bombings. And uh, so it led me to believe that if Haverhill Community Television was on that particular Patriots Day, that this was not a holiday that they took off. But as usual, no one tells us anything. And, um, you know, <laughs> this is why we need an FM radio station, ladies and gentlemen. Pardon, pardon my being a little bit cranky, but, you know, last week... Well, you, don't, you don't need an FM station. You need an FM station, and you need to see the Cable Television Commission completely gutted and started all over again. Yeah, well, you know, last week, um, it seems that uh, the minute the mayor came on, they were decided to rewire the community television station. And as soon as the mayor was off, the rewiring was done. You tell me what that means, ladies and gentlemen. It means I would have a terse note from the city solicitor sent. Well, you know, it's an interesting question, and I'll have to I actually, I'm going to say something that uh, will sound like I'm defending community television, uh, but it's simply a legal fact. Um you know, they're a private nonprofit. Uh, they can do whatever they want, I suppose. Uh, only advice I would give them, though, is yes, while they can do anything they want, uh, the city also doesn't have to give them uh, money from the Comcast contract. But, you know, they have. Well, that's going to gonna make it really tough to pay for their overpriced backup station that hasn't been built. Uh, you mean the condo at Harbor Place? Or, as I like to call it, the blowhole on the white whale. <laughs> well, aren't you kind? All right. Well, well it is public radio. Uh, hey, David, can you hold one second? Because we have some screen captures, courtesy of you, that we'd like to put up, but we need to take a break first. Yeah, I think I could use a break before I actually looked at myself on the cable television. All right. We'll be back right back with more of the Open Mic Show. David Gauss were discussing mysteries at the museum, nearly one million viewers. And that doesn't include people who uh, recorded the show or the future repeats. So please stay with us. Open Mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. WHAV is on Facebook. For quick access, visit whav.net and click on the Facebook icon. Catch the wave! Those political sound bites you hear on the news are, at best, incomplete and could be misleading or even outright lies. This is David Pakman. Take time to delve into the truth by listening to The David Pakman Show Tuesday through Friday nights at 8 on WHAV. Lack of logic and reason are exposed on The David Pakman Show as newsmakers collapse under cross-examination. Remember, only local radio can bring you this talk opportunity, but only WHAV does. Today is April 20th. On this day in 1919, striking telephone operators in Massachusetts won the right to negotiate with the New England Telephone Company. The young single women who had flooded into the industry in the early 1900s wanted higher wages and better working conditions. When they took off their headsets and walked off the job, they brought business in New England to a standstill. Government officials and industry executives were surprised by the women's organization and determination. In less than a week, the phone company agreed to the strikers' demands. The victorious operators returned to work, but within a few years, they would face a greater threat, the self-dial telephone. Manually operated switchboards would soon be more common in museums than city telephone offices. For more about this and other Mass Moments, go online to massmoments.org. Brought to you by the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities. Some go favorites, the most music. Catch the wave. W-H-A-V. Open mic.
From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. This hour of the Open Mic being brought to you by Haverhill Bank, just one bank. On the telephone with us tonight is David Goudswood, WHAB, an Open Mic Show uh, Haverhill historian. Actually, does a lot more than just Haverhill. Uh, he's an author of uh, quite a few books, his latest being Horror Guide to Florida. Am I correct, David? You are correct. Is that book out or coming out or ready to it be will, reserved? It, is, it will be out. Let's see. This is almost May. It should be out in the end of May, possibly early June. Um, oh. sure, surely by coincidence, I have a, another TV appearance coming up this summer, and we're trying to get it out in time for that. All right. Well, speaking of which, on screen, at least for two seconds, we had a picture of David Goudsward uh, as he appeared on Mysteries at the Museum. Uh, David pointed out uh, where we might find those graphics, and he appeared uh, on the Travel Channel, the program Mysteries at the Museum, nearly one million viewers when it first ran, and this episode was about Haverhill. David, you want to recap this for us? And what do you think of your photograph on screen? <laughs> I, I've seen worse recently. Hey, it looks very studious to me. I like it. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Um, based on just the look, I would say we were about two hours into the tape making by that point. And we taped for about three and a half hours altogether for, a, for an eight-minute spot. And there's a thoughtful pose if you're, if you're seeing it at the same time I am. Pretty, pretty close. The delay on my uh, computer is about three seconds behind you. This is our uh, second and final week of testing. We like this service, and we will be buying it. Uh, there will never, ever be a commercial on, uh, this, um, on this channel, and that will solve some problems. Mm. All right. Um, Except when I call, which is just one big commercial. All right. Now, uh, Nate... Okay, well, we do have a guest in the studio. It'll be coming in at 7 o'clock. Uh, former Haverhill Mayor, City Councilor Bill Ryan will be on uh, just after the news at 7. I've already mentioned uh, Bill on the program because he and his lovely wife Maureen uh, contributed to WHAV's Make Waves campaign. Thank you very much, Bill and Maureen. All right. Uh, Nate, well, how about show us another slide, and then maybe David can tell us uh, the story behind it. I believe we see a picture or a dramatization of um, Dr. Duncan McDougall of Haverhill. Well, the, the concept of this show, for, for those of you who haven't seen it, and frankly, why haven't you, um, is that they go to a museum somewhere in um, mostly North America. They've been known to, to pop off to the other countries on occasion, but it's mostly North America. They go in, they have a local person describe an object in the collection and tell the backstory of why that item is in the collection, why it's so interesting, and more importantly, why it should be told the story. So, for instance, my episode had five pieces in it, um, and one of them was mine. And I, my first appearance is coming in and describing a scale, and it's a type of scale that was used by Duncan McDougall. Now, this particular scale is located in a railroad museum in Washington State. This is this is the rare case where they saw the story, they liked the story, and then they found an artifact to justify filming the story. Normally what they do is they have the museum contact them and say, hey, we got this piece and there's the story of it. We did it backwards this time, simply because it was such a fun story. I then break into the story telling them how Duncan McDougall is a doctor working with tuberculosis. He finds a scale in the basement, and they proceed to use that to try to measure the weight of the human soul. While I'm talking, or the uh, host of the show, Don Wildman, is talking, 
they're doing the historic recreations, which are mostly filmed in New York with um, local actors. All right, now, for our listeners who who are familiar with the McDougal name, can you um, can you can you sp- spell out the um, the genealogy a little bit about how Duncan McDougal relates to uh, more contemporary folks? Well, I think most people listening probably remember Judge McDougal from the courthouse down here in Little Old Haverhill. That is actually his grandson. All right. His, his father was a banker in town, and then Duncan McDougal was, of course the progenitor of the family in Haverhill. They had a house where the um, Social Security office now stands on. I I wonder if our guest coming on, Bill Ryan, remembers the McDougal house where Social Security was. Uh, Bill lived on Fountain Street. That's right. He should should know it then. Oh, I'll tell you what, you know, we should have had Bill in here earlier, but... (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) And, uh, well, in three minutes we'll go to news, and then we'll have Bill in and maybe see what his memories are. You know, uh, David Goudswood wrote the story of uh, Duncan McDougal, the man who weighed souls. And, unfortunately, you had trouble finding a, um, a monument uh, to him. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing at the Social Security office. Um, although Greg Lang, the, the, the late lamented director of special collections at the library back when we had one, he insisted that one of the trees on the front lawn of the Social Security building was from the McDougal estate. They didn't think that was a strong enough tie-in for an artifact. Um, there wasn't even a, um, a gravestone. He's buried in Mount Auburn. In fact, the, the whole family is, and he doesn't have a headstone for some reason. And the reason those are even in discussion, because obviously they're not artifacts in the museum, was that the original concept was to do this episode for monumental mysteries which is the sister program of mysteries at the museum one does artifacts other one does entire monuments and statues and bridges and fancy buildings and all that and that's that's the one that desperately wanted to do the duncan mcdougall story and we just could not find a a monument to the man anywhere might be something for Haver to look into that's an idea. That's an idea. And what, you, uh, what you've reported is that uh, he wasn't, um, as maybe some contemporary um, interpretations of Dr. McDougall, he wasn't some kind of, uh, pardon the, the term, folks, some kind of crazy person. He was actually trying to, uh, to prove scientifically a religious point. Yeah. It's, Unfortunately for him, it was a theological discussion, and he was a doctor, and it it wasn't going to work with the equipment he had either way. Um, The Presbyterian Church at that point was having a bit of a schism over evolution. The Presbyterian universities had started teaching evolution, and the churches were not happy about it. Uh, Because of the ramifications, if mankind evolved from animals, where did the soul come from? Because the Presbyterians, as far as I know, still don't believe animals have souls. Therefore, the soul, if man is evolved from animals, is a later addition provided by God in a strictly spiritual construct. Whereas if the Bible is taken literally, Adam and Eve, then the soul is a physical manifestation that was built in from the start. In which case, when you die, that soul should leave the body, there should be a noticeable drop in weight. If there's a noticeable drop in weight when you die, that means that the soul was physical, the soul was physical, evolution does not exist, because that's a, right out of Genesis. It is a literal translation. All right. Well, thank you for shedding so much light on that and bringing one million viewers to a story about Haverhill. You know, last week during this very program, uh, I was touting the fact that 100,000, 100,000 Facebook uh, views of WHAV last week, and now David brings us 1 million television viewers to the Travel Channel learning about Haverhill, Massachusetts. David, you are a um, one-man promotional agency for Haverhill. Well, the running joke down here is I've taught one million people how to pronounce Haverhill, 
and one million people who still can't pronounce my last name. Oh, that's right. That's actually, I've noticed even on this program a few weeks ago when Mark was filling in for me. Uh, but I've, you know, I appreciate him filling in. But uh, hey, you, you were kind. I recognize it. You were kind about it. <laughs> if I recognize it, I consider it a win. All right, David, we have to go to news, local news with Dana Esmo, and we're going to be back with former Haverhill mayor, current Haverhill city council, a former Haverhill school committee man, former state former state rep. Uh, I think you did something at the jail, too, didn't you? Not serve. <laughs> He was the well, master. That many years in public service, it's not out of the question. <laughs> master of the jail. But anyway, sorry, David, thanks for the commentary, too. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll talk to you real soon, then. Talk to you later, Ted. Thanks. All right, we'll, we're going to news uh, and local weather. We'll be back with uh, Bill Ryan. Everyone knows him as Bill Ryan. I mean, we could call him William H. Ryan if, for people who want to be particular. But Bill Ryan will be with us after the news. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 7.02. WHAV Merrimack Valley. WHAV is a not-for-profit service of Public Media of New England Incorporated. It's heard on 1640 AM, the web, at whav.net and participating cable television stations. Here's what's happening in local news. Processes used by the Haverhill City Council to set speed limits and heavy commercial vehicle exclusions on local streets are, quote, currently not correct and require state approval, according to City Engineer John H. Pettis III. The Council on Tuesday night will place on file for two weeks a request by Pettis to amend existing city ordinances on speed and weight limits to conform with state regulations. Quote, a review of the subject city code sections has found that these sections are currently not correct, Per Massachusetts general law, speed regulations and truck exclusions can be made by city council only with the written approval of MassDOT, with Registrar of Motor Vehicles approval also required for speed regulations, Pettis said in a memo to the council. According to council documents, if the revision is approved, speed limits on a number of local streets and state highways would revert to those set between 1970 and 1984. Streets which would be affected include Broadway, Concord Street, and Upper Main Street, as well as Hilldale and Canosa Avenues. Also, weight limits set on streets including Boardman and Lake Streets, as well as Merrill Avenue, would be at those set between 1988 and 1993. Other regulations would require state approval of traffic lights at intersections with state highways. Proposed changes to the speed limit on Canosa Avenue, also known as the John Greenleaf Whittier Highway, would require state approval. The Haverhill City Council meets at 7 p.m. Tuesday in Council Chambers at Haverhill City Hall. Two Haverhill men are due to be arraigned in court after their arrest by police in connection with an altercation over the weekend. According to Haverhill Police, Dalvin F. Andino, 18, of Haverhill, and Gilbert Vasquez, 18, of Haverhill, were arrested at 1.45 p.m. Saturday at 4 Temple Street. Each is charged with two counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. Haverhill Police also report five minutes later nearby, Lawrence Green, 36, listed as homeless, was arrested at 1.50 p.m. at the intersection of Central and Beacon Streets. He was charged with two counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and with two counts of intimidation of a witness. In other police news, a Lawrence man is facing various drug and motor vehicle charges after his arrest in Haverhill Sunday evening. Haverhill Police report James A. Marr, 44, of Lawrence, was arrested at 5.50 p.m. Sunday at 73 White Street. He is charged with possession of a Class B substance, operating a motor vehicle with a suspended license, and a stop sign violation. Marr was also taken into custody on two outstanding warrants for possession of a Class B substance, operating an uninsured motor vehicle, operating a motor vehicle with a suspended registration, and with not having a license in possession. 
Also, a Haverhill man is due in court to face a drug dealing charge after his arrest Friday by Haverhill police. Joel Gomez, 31, of Haverhill, was arrested at 7 p.m. Friday on Vine Street. He was charged with distribution of a Class A substance. Police in Methuen are asking the public's help to identify a suspect who robbed two neighborhood stores, one at Knife Point, within a three-hour span Sunday morning. Surveillance videos released by Methuen police show a Hispanic male, approximately 6 feet 1 inch in height, wearing a black hooded sweatshirt, a black mask and latex gloves, with tattoos on his hands, first entering the CVS Pharmacy, 76 Swan Street, about 8 a.m. Sunday. Quote, the suspect handed the cashier money for candy. When she opened the cash register, the suspect reached over the counter and into the drawer and took some money from the register. The male subject then fled the store on foot and was last seen running towards Conduit Street, a Methuen police spokesperson said. About three hours later, the same suspect brandished a knife as he took cash from a register at Family Dollar Store, 40 Jackson Street, Methuen. Anyone with information is asked to contact Methuen Police at 978-983-8698 or Detective Keith Frost at 978-983-8709. Remember, WHAV is the only Haver-based news source and it's always free. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Dana Esmail. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Kevin McAleese. Foreign and interior ministers from the European Union meeting in Luxembourg have vowed to cooperate more to deal with the migrant crisis developing in the Mediterranean. At least 700 people drowned in a single incident over the weekend, prompting widespread criticism from humanitarian groups over the lack of a unified European search and rescue mission. Our Europe correspondent Jack Parrock reports. The President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, has called the leaders of the 28 EU countries for an emergency meeting in Brussels Thursday. Southern European countries with Mediterranean coastlines like Italy and Greece have been calling for their partners in the northern member states to help them tackle the issue, as the migrants' destinations are spread across the bloc. The EU's foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, says an awareness of deeper cooperation is growing. We've talked about uh, other measures, intelligence cooperation, regional protection programs, but also the issue of destroying ships. The EU will try to engage with Libya from where many of the flimsy smugglers' ships are setting off. But humanitarian groups insist until an EU-wide search and rescue operation is implemented, many more lives will be lost. Six men from the U.S. state of Minnesota have been arrested after allegedly attempting to travel to Syria to try to join the militant group Islamic State. Our correspondent, Mary McCarthy, has more. The FBI says the six men had been trying to join the so-called Islamic State over the past 10 months by any means possible. Four of them were arrested in Minnesota and the other two were apprehended after driving from there to California. Authorities say there's a major problem with Islamic militant recruiting in the city of Minneapolis. Over the past year, several other residents have traveled to Syria to fight with IS. And since 2007, over 20 Somali men have also traveled from Minnesota to Somalia to join the militant group Al-Shabaab. A U.S. air carrier is being moved into the waters of the Arabian Sea as a result of the deteriorating security situation in Yemen. But it's not clear whether the USS Theodore Roosevelt will try to intercept Iranian vessels that are heading to Yemen to resupply Houthi rebels. From Washington, Simon Marks reports. It's a dramatic move by the Pentagon. The USS Theodore Roosevelt and another American naval ship are taking up positions off the Yemeni coast just as an Iranian flotilla heads to the country with supplies for the Houthis. But apart from saying the U.S. is concerned about Iran's continued support for the rebels, the White House won't say whether there are plans to intercept the Iranian supply ships. The move comes at a delicate moment in nuclear negotiations with Iran. So far, U.S. forces have not boarded any Iranian ships since the violence in Yemen began. Simon Marks, Washington. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Wave weather! 
I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with wave weather. Cloudy for tonight with periods of rain. Initially temperatures in the 40s, then rising a bit perhaps overnight. During the day Tuesday, mostly cloudy, breezy, and milder into the 60s with a few scattered showers around. Slight chance at some thunder as well. Maybe a few showers Tuesday night back in the low to mid 40s. And for Wednesday, partly sunny. Chance of a shower. Temperatures near or just a bit over 60. I'm Gary Best. Your next wave weather in 30 minutes. Still not sure when your favorite features are broadcast? Check out the What's On page at www.whav.net for complete listings. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. This hour of the Open Mic Show is being brought to you by Haverhill Bank, just one bank. And uh, with me, can I call you an old friend? Barney Gallagher would be mad if I said old friend, but I can't call you a former friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> you're close enough to me. <laughs> old friend. Bill Ryan. You know, I go way back, and when I was uh, first a reporter uh, for WHAV in uh, 1978, what were you doing in 78? I was running the jail. Almost. You were running the jail, and then um, you were on the license commission when I After think that. I met you then, right. and then I was working for the Haverhill Gazette in, 80, in 1980, end of 1980, and this completely unknown... <laughs> Not really. Decides he's going to run for mayor. Like, oh, yeah, sure. And he wins. <laughs> and he wins again. And he wins again. And then he loses. But that's all right. <laughs> Finally, they caught up to that. <laughs> no, but, but no, um, Bill Ryan's been certainly um, a, an observer of the city. Uh, one of the things I remember the most, is, and, and some of the longtime listeners might remember this, but uh, the new Hale Hospital, now maybe we'll have some regrets about it now, but the new Hale Hospital uh, almost didn't happen. And I believe it was your first day in office, Bill, that you allowed the loan authorization to go forward to build a new hospital. Well, actually, uh, Tim, you're, you, you're in the right area, but you were one building off. It was the Glen Memorial Nursing Home. Okay, you they, saved the Glen. Right. They, they the were, first, okay, that's right. We are two different things going on. There was... Um, the previous mayor and the rest uh, of the folks had uh, uh, decided not to uh, make the upgrades at the Department of Public Health that over, would oversee uh, the... Uh, the building and, the, and how patients are treated and, and cared for and the condition of the building. Sure, the roof wasn't leaking and whatever. But we needed a lot of upgrades and they had less demands and uh, we, uh, I had met with the light, uh, not the light, God, <laughs> you got me going off guard here. Uh, my good friend, Bill Clover, I hope he's not listening. Uh, uh, sorry, we, Bill. Yeah, uh, but uh, Bill, <laughs> Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Clover, I, I had met with him while I was ma uh, mayor-elect to draft up necessary papers to sign a loan order to save the Glen Nursing Home, which had terrific support in the community. Everybody uh, knew somebody down there. They knew somebody that worked there. It was a real local uh, institution. It was one of only two non-profit nursing homes in yeah, the city, one of, right? right. Well, it was probably the only one. Well, Pentecook is, uh, well, what was Union Mission at the uh, time? It was it was the last municipal nursing home. Right. Uh, the Bessie Burke and Lawrence. There was one in Lynn, Worcester County had one. They were all falling by the wayside. We were the last, but we did a little bit of work, and uh, it survived for a number of years after that. We, we got a grant, uh, which I worked on in my uh, last year as mayor, and uh, then my successor, Ted Pelosi, finished. The, the new building that was left to it, but uh, uh, 
Uh, it was a favorite of mine. I, I love the Glen and the people that were down there. It was named after our former mayor. Uh, Albert W., right? He was. Uh, What's uh, a W for? You know? <clears throat> Until uh, Jim Rurek came along, he was the longest serving mayor. His uh, middle name was William, and he did have a son, William, uh, also. Uh, the uh, he was the long, uh, longest serving mayor up until Jim Rorek, who uh, beat him by about a year and a half. And now Jim Ferentini's beat uh, uh, Jim Rorek. And I told the mayor, the next guy or th will probably beat you, you know, because the, the huh. you don't have the, the media uh, scrutiny that you had in the old days. We're working on it. Two newspapers, <laughs> the radio station, and everything else. Uh, on every issue that goes on now, you're lucky if you can, you know, regardless of how big the issue is, uh, there's nothing in the paper. No, it's a very, it's a very good point, though, which is the reason why uh, we brought back WHAV, got it licensed. I appreciate your kind words at the city council meeting a few right. weeks ago, uh, but it's important that I mean, local democracy de depends on people knowing the issues, and um, and in my case, remembering them. But the uh, the hospital uh, seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, former Mayor Bethali was kind of wondering about whether or not he should actually build it. Well, there's, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it was a... Uh, it, the groundbreaking took place during your administration, right? Uh, but, uh, yes. It did. I was there. Okay, I remember something. Well, they, they had gone, they had a, named a building committee <clears throat> and uh, the, the uh, former... Warren Fry was the uh, uh, city councilor at the time, or, or a promised city councilor, I believe. He uh, and a group of people tried to start an independent hotel, I'm um, sorry, hospital, the uh, Essex Hospital. And oh, okay. Remember that? They had big meetings over at DeBurrows, and uh, that never got off the ground because they had to deal with the pension fund, which was enormous, and they wanted us to absorb that, and they'd go off and do the medical treatment. And, uh, of course, that... Uh, never really would fly, and it did in the end. We ended up absorbing uh, the uh, retirement fund, which was an okay. awful lot of money. I think we borrowed uh, thirty million dollars to to close the hospital. Was a was it a, a good thing in in its day to have the Hale Hospital? <clears throat> it was the largest employer. Some seven hundred people worked there. Uh, another hundred or fifty or sixty over at the Glen. Uh, they all lived in Haverhill. Uh, there was terrific support in the city because you knew somebody that worked there, you knew one of the nurses, a doctor, they lived in the city. Uh, everyone was part of, uh, very much in part of that hospital. And in the end, uh, it was very hard. It, it actually went out of business, it just ran out of money because, not because of local support, is because they changed the reimbursement formulas for delivery. It was the end of an era, wasn't it? And, right, and also, People don't realize the, uh, it would have gone even sooner, but when the Pawtucket Medical building that's now located on Main Street uh, was going up to Plasto, New Hampshire with 30 beds, and that would have just killed the, a brand new hospital. So uh, we, we worked very hard with uh, the people that put together the, uh, the uh, uh, that particular uh, building to stay in Haverhill. It was a group of doctors, and of course, you need a doctor to get in the hospital, you need a doctor to refer you. So if all the local doctors are going to be down at Pawtucket, Pawtucket Medical, I'm sorry, in Plasto, with 30 beds, whether in anything that's not profitable. So if you don't get you the referrals, have, you don't fill the beds. Well, we were starting to get all of the unprofitable services. If something made a lot of money, it went to some other hospital or it went inside their office. There was more and more services by uh, physicians. You're right. I mean, people Within used to get an x-ray at the hospital. Now, now to, to this day, you don't. Right, you go to an office. Well, a lot of these procedures uh, were unprofitable. And if they were unprofitable, you could guarantee they're going to send them to and the And if the patient was hospital. uninsured, you couldn't throw them out, so they became to the hospital. Okay. We have to take a break for Community Spotlight. We'll be back with <clears throat> Haverhill City Councilor and former Haverhill Mayor Bill Ryan in just one minute. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. 
call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. This spot could have been yours. Support WHAV's local approach with your underwriting. Go to whav.net and click on support to reach thousands of new customers. Community Spotlight is brought to you by Haverhill Bank. Haverhill Bank is a generous supporter of the area's civic and cultural program. That's all it takes, it's just one bank. Haverhill Bank. Community Spotlight. The Plasto Recreation Department has extended their innovative logo contest for the summer recreation program. Logo ideas should be submitted to the department by Friday, May 1st. Entries are scanned and appear on the Friends of Plastow Recreation Facebook page for voting for a week. Winner receives $50 GameStop gift card and a summer recreation sweatshirt with their logo. Winner will be announced on Friday, May 15th. Contact the Recreation Department with any questions by calling 603-382-5200, extension 18. Someone you know is on WHAV. To submit or read your own nonprofit announcements, click on the Contact tab at whav.net or email news at whav.net. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Sarah Tiza. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show. This hour of Open Mic being brought to you by Haverhill Bank. Just one bank. All right, before we get to the a tough question I have for Bill, and then we'll change subjects. Before we get to that, Bill, do you know what you want to wish anyone a, a happy birthday or happy anniversary who's celebrating in May? I'll be celebrating my wedding anniversary, May 5th. May 5th? 47 years. All right, put Bill Ryan, Bill and Maureen Ryan in the hat for a May anniversary. May 5th. Uh, May 5th, and uh, you... Uh, and Maureen may very well be enjoying a cake from LBD Second Generation Italian Bakery, 140 South Main Street. Uh, LBD Second Generation Italian Bakery provides uh, each month a free birthday cake or a free anniversary cake to one lucky winner. So you and Maureen are entered uh, uh, into the contest. Excellent. Last last month it was kind of odd. I had to miss the we do the drawing the last Monday of the month. I had to miss the broadcast because I had two wisdom teeth removed that day. And my aunt won the cake. So mm. it's a good thing I wasn't here. People would think it was, uh, you know, collusion or something. <laughs> so uh, it is possible. Uh, here's the tough question uh, for you, Bill. And of course, I forgot what it was. <laughs> I guess right. I'm getting old. <laughs> All right. At the ho- it's something to do with the hospital. Okay. If the. Um, Oh, Holy Family at Merrimack Valley Hospital. What has happened, it appears that uh, um, Stewart bought both hospitals and now have combined them under the same license. So it's one hospital with two campuses. Are we going to see uh, are we going to see the hospital close in Haverhill? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it, it's all economics with these folks. They're a private company. If they're making money, they're going to keep it. Uh, I think maybe the use will be a little different. They might uh, find other ways to make money. Uh, they're pretty uh, smart people. Uh, I, I think they have a lot of restrictions in the hospitals, like St. Elizabeth's. And uh, well, they did, but they closed Quincy Medical Center. Yeah, but despite lo- but you know, part of the agreement with the archdiocese is you know no abortions, no this, you know uh, it's uh, there are restrictions, and I think having. Uh, our Merrimack Valley Hospital, a Holy Family at Merrimack Valley, the new name, 
uh, I like my old name, they wouldn't go for him at council. Havel General Hospital. That's right, I remember that. After the movie, and they didn't want to go for it. Uh, the, uh, I think the, uh, the, they're happy to have that hospital, and they'll eventually move a lot of services out of Holy Family, in my opinion, down to uh, the uh, Merrimack Valley, where they're not going to be restricted by the agreement with the Archdiocese. Interesting, very interesting. All right, so the rules that apply to Holy Family and Bethune don't apply to the Merrimack Valley Correct. campus, the former Hale Hospital. All right, Bill, uh, another tough one for you. Um, we are sitting, uh, and we're supposed to be on the air on Haverhill Community Television Channel 22. Uh, last week, uh, the minute the mayor showed up at the door, they suddenly had to start rewiring, and uh, the mayor did not appear uh, on Channel 22. Um, this week, they just figured uh, they would take the day off. Well, uh, it is a holiday, Tim. It's it's it. Two Amen. years ago, two years ago, when the marathon bombings took place, I was here at this desk reporting the news, and they were covering it. So it's it's new for them to take this holiday. But uh, in any event, what's going to happen this week? Are you going to the city council subcommittee meeting? No, I'm not on that particular committee, and uh, the uh, they're going to be reviewing. Uh, there are a number of issues that have been raised about local access and. Uh, uh, I think it's it's uh, a prelude to other events that are going to happen when the contract expires. And they, well, when you they, were mayor, they may be doing something else. All the money that they live off over at the the, the HC uh, uh, Media is money that comes from people who subscribe to Comcast. Uh, Fifty cents, I believe, goes to each for every uh, customer goes comes over. about. Eight hundred thousand a year. That's a lot of money. Now, when when now, Bill, if I may be so bold, you've calmed down in your uh, older, not old, older age. You've calmed down, uh, but if I, I think I knew you pretty well back in those days. If um, if the if I'm here long enough, we'll get wound up. We'll, <laughs> well, community television. I mean, you wouldn't. <coughs> You would find a way to uh, to void the contract if you were mayor. No, I think when we <laughs> no, I, I think when we rewrite the contract, we have to look at the the past history. Uh, you know, we've looked for the lights in the city council to be upgraded so that people can see us. Well, whose responsibility is it up to them? Well, we ask them. No, it's probably. Well, see, that's the thing. I have to say, I'm going to defend them in one area. They are a private nonprofit. I haven't asked uh, one of our uh, one of my colleagues on the council has been been after them. To upgrade the light so people can see us and the and, and the audio as well that a lot of times people can't hear us uh, and some microphones work better than others you know they've got some money coming in what the, well, I noticed that your mic is always on and not everyone else's is <laughs> yeah, out, out, outside of the, sh the shows I mean I we do a show uh, as chairman of the Republican City Committee we meet at the library they do a wonderful job they have uh, volunteers come down they replay it and I always uh, write a letter to uh, uh, the uh, to the HC Media. What a great job they did, and thank you. So they, in, in some cases, they excel. Uh, the volunteers are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, there's some really good people there. It seems like maybe it's a problem with the administration there. Well, I can't. I wouldn't. No, I, I mean I get along great with them, Tim. And, and uh, you're, afraid they're gonna, you're afraid they're going to shut you off like they shut me off. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> see. There's Bill Ryan being the pragmatist. Here. No, I, I, <laughs> no, I, th I think that the uh, the whole contract. Nate's a volunteer up, over there. And I think who's ever mayor, whether it's uh, 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 Jim Ferentini or whoever's mayor, they got to rewrite this contract so that we got a little more control. You know, I'm not. We, we, it might even make sense for us to bring it in because I look at Methuen and other communities. They got a much more uh, uh, all-around program. And uh, well, they're not buying. Studio. They're not buying one million dollar condos. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that <laughs> that's an issue. Putting you on the spot. Okay, now uh, I I believe there are people in city government now, and maybe you're one of them that said, hey, you know, that million dollars helped make this project possible. Do you think Harbor Place could have survived without the million dollar condo they sold to to Haverhill Community Television? Uh, I think Harbor Place is a. Uh, we got to jump around, aren't we? No, no, <laughs> no Harbor Place, which people know is the new. Uh, University of uh, Lowell, well, uh, UMass right. uh, Lowell, which is going to be located in Haverhill, and also 
in order to make it work, I mean, a, a lot of the money that's been put in up, up to this point, buying the buildings, moving people around, move, we, we've got some people going to the Smiley the School. school yeah, that's right. And that's Good job. all being done to get them out of there. We have the, the uh, and there's a uh, f folks, they're affiliated with Leahy Clinic in a mental health that's uh, right well there facility uh, what's happening with that anything well new? they got to find a location for i it. mean their building's been damaged they, by the wrecking ball. i was going to recommend this building you're in here looks pretty oh really you know, well, why houses. not why not and you don't mind all those guys outside with all the cigarette butts i was smoking right? next to that i know that dr rose used to be upset <laughs> about them ducking into his doorway to smoke their now cigarettes. we already own that bill it's a combination of state money federal money university money Right. You're a Republican. Money. What do you think of Democrat Brian Dempsey, who brought all that money here? I think he did a, he did a good thing <laughs> for Havel. I, you know, he's got the power. Uh, I can recall. Uh, You've actually never been really a partisan, have you? I mean, no. you supported Brian way back yeah. when, when he was a right. teenager. I, I have. Uh, uh, I look at what's good for the city. You know, if it's good for the city, you, you know, don't be a partisan. Do the right thing and, and uh, support it. And what about the 80 units of housing that's going to go up in the lot next to that's good the the project? Where are where are those people going to park? Uh, they're going to have uh, inside parking. They'll have uh, to be able to drive. Not enough for all. Have you, of them. have you been down there to see? There's yeah. a lot of depth between Merrimack Street and the river. Well, well, you're so going to have some commercial stuff in there. There's plenty of room for multi. There'll be multiple level parking. If, there, if there's plenty of room, why did they need Let, to leave a hundred spaces in the parking deck? That's only to get this thing. We haven't designed the building yet. <laughs> okay. uh, what, what's his name? This uh, is 60 Minutes now, Bill. <laughs> no, I, let's go down to the uh, uh, the uh, former Bixby shoe building. Right. At the corner of the bridge where we added two floors. And they've got a nice little parking, small parking area next to it. I would say that's one of the success stories when it comes to housing. It is, and it works well. People live there, love That it. was during your administration? That's correct. It would have been two stories higher, <laughs> but uh, the city council, well, they always try and put their two cents in. Uh, well, well, can you cut it down two floors? Well, now you're on the council. And I remember so. saying to the former councilor, Judge Deacon, Judge, why are you doing that? Now I confront him why he did that. He said he never did. I says, uh, of course you did. Hey, Bill, can you hang around a little bit more? Yeah. Hey, let's go to uh, local weather. We'll return with Bill Ryan on the Open Mic Show. Open Mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 7.33. Phil Christie here. Those Boston stations don't always understand weather in the Merrimack Valley. Stay informed with Wave Weather every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day on Soft Gold, WHAV. Catch the wave! Here. Don't forget your free ticket to the biggest theater in the world. Your seat is reserved for Modern Theater of the Mind every Tuesday night. WHAV presents Radio Theater Project, a new anthology series of comedies, dramas, mysteries, and science fiction. Tune in every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. or the encore performance at 1 a.m. Remember, only local radio can bring you this feature opportunity, but only WHAV does. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with Wave Weather. Cloudy for tonight with periods of rain. Initially temperatures in the 40s, then rising a bit perhaps overnight. During the day Tuesday, mostly cloudy, breezy, and milder into the 60s with a few scattered showers around. Slight chance at some thunder as well. Maybe a few showers Tuesday night back in the low to mid 40s. And for Wednesday, partly sunny. Chance of a shower. Temperatures near or just a bit over 60. I'm Gary Best. Your next Wave Weather in 30 minutes. Music. W-H-A-V. Open mic. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. 
Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And welcome back to the Open Mic Show. This hour of Open Mic is being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. And here's a uh, booster for the Merrimack Valley, Haverhill City Councilor Bill Ryan. Uh, so, you know, you, you've, you've done all the major elected jobs in Haverhill. Uh, do you have a favorite? Did you prefer to be mayor? Do you like council? Do you think school committee was good for you? They're all fun when you have them, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think the uh, uh, probably the the your favorite is always the first one, state representative, going to the state house. Oh, did you like that? Well, I think it's because I was young and full of a lot of energy, and it was my uh, first elected office. Pardon my 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 memory. Uh, did you give that up, or were you redistricted out, or I what? gave it up to take over the jail, in Lawrence? Okay, all right. Took over superintendent, or at the time master and keeper, but it was the basically the superintendent of the jail and house of correction for Essex County, uh, and the building was next to Central Catholic in Lawrence. Okay, so right. And it was a. Uh, I, I had done six years in the legislature, and I. That would sound like a great challenge, you know, something really exciting to do. And I was there four years and up at the Department of Correction for a couple of You saw all the people you used to work with in there. <laughs> no. yeah, I still see them all. <laughs> no, I, met, I, I met the legislators. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, I was always jail. nice to the inmates because I knew I'd run into them down in <laughs> Merrimack Street in Haverhill. All right. And, uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> Bill, when you, I, I, I'm trying to recall, are you the last mayor to have a full time economic development director? Because we had. Almost since we've had you know one person in the job planning and economic development. You had Gene O'Neill in economic development and Joe Bevilacqua in planning. Right. You're the last mayor to have had separate jobs. Oh, it's a very important job. We had kind of a team. But isn't there isn't there an inherent conflict if you're the planning director who's saying, listen, I want more sidewalks and I want. Uh, no, we all work together. You had uh, Bill Pillsbury. Who did? Who's back? Well, he's still. Yes, yeah, he's he, back. He's planning. Doing a great job. You've got Bill Pillsbury, Gene O'Neill, and Joe Bevilacqua, a great team. They all work together because, as the mayor, I told them, if you work together or you work no, some other place, in the, in, all, the, in, the now it, team. in the now it can be told is that um, Bill Ryan, I'm going to say this, and he can be quiet if he wants, but I think it's, I think it's a good story. Uh, way back when... Bill Ryan went to the city council with a reorganization of city government. You know, what, you know, the division directors, and I remember all the crazy titles, the class A directors and class B directors, and you were going to simplify that structure. And um, city council wouldn't let you. So you pretty much had to tell uh, Gene O'Neill and Joe Bevacqua and Bill Pillsbury that no matter what the organizational chart says, Gene is in charge. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that was one way to get things done, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you really, those positions are all very important. Uh, uh, at the time, we had a lot of federal money, and Bill Pillsbury's job was overseeing that, how we spent it. And of course, Joe was our planning director, and we had a lot going on in the city, he did a great job. And then. I uh, dare say that all of the th good things that were going on. Probably led to your downfall. There was, we, we overdid it. We actually, you know, there was too much success, and people looked around, and there were thousands of condos and buildings and uh, you name it going up. We were doing the downtown area. You had, you had uh, I was, the, the late uh, uh, Ted Pelosi wanted to fix Merrimack Street, and I said, Ted, Merrimack Street's history. It's a couple of banks. The future is on Washington Street, Wingate, that area. Actually, I have to and say, uh, you impressed me during that time because, again, I'm going to I'm going to tell that the city council was focused on Merrimack Street, and you're saying you got a, a catalyst is possible if you do Washington Street because there actually there are buildings there on, as opposed to the broken streetscape mm -hmm. that is Merrimack. You're, you remember they uh, they wanted a full depth reconstruction, reconstruction and I paid, uh, not personally, the city economic <laughs> development director, I don't uh, want to mislead anyone, we hired a company to run cameras through the sewer system. They're still running today, aren't they? They were in perfect, it looked like marble inside it, there was no, uh, you know, as pipes can, uh, they're like, uh, you 
your arteries right. that get clogged up after a while. They were clean as a whistle all the way down. Why do we want to dig up all of these pipes? They all work, everything's in great shape. Of course, after I left, they did put all the money on Merrimack Street, but they never did the full depth. <coughs> no, well, but interesting. It, it, good. it was a waste of money. Uh, you started with, now, uh, let me explain <coughs> this to uh, the listeners and viewers, because I think it's interesting. There's one pot of money in the city that only the mayor can spend. He doesn't need the city council's permission. He doesn't need anyone's permission. And when Bill Ryan was mayor, that pot of money had more than a million dollars in it. It's community development block grants. Um, and you, you do have guidelines. There are guidelines. You have there, to do are, certain things with HUD, of course. And you got to be in certain. You can't just go in any. Oh no, right. They have to be low income and so be, on. You know, you're very and, restricted. But nevertheless, the council didn't want you to do Washington Street. The Fed said you could. And you did. You started with awnings. And we got uh, the uh, feds approved awnings. We paid uh, 100%. Uh, we put an awning up and decorate the building. And, and we're trying to Amazing. Find pump and get the. When someone puts up an awning, then the guy next door says, gee, my building looks kind of shabby. Maybe I'll fix these windows. And next thing you know, all the buildings were being restored. And then we did, uh, we come up with a unique one. Nobody had done it. Because of the old uh, cable elevators in every one of the buildings, we came up with elevator assistance. In other words, but it was only very few people percentage. took advantage of it, though, right? Well, because it's you know, hundred and hundred and at least a hundred thousand dollars probably at the time to put in these elevators that were all electric, right? Not the push button or I mean, uh, uh, hydraulic. They were okay. uh, they were the electric. They're very expensive. I think we offered 25 percent or 30 percent, and they had a com nobody. Could come. We might have had one or two come up with the money. All right, now, Bill, you're a, a seasoned observer of politics as well as a, a good observer of the local scene, and they the two come together in this next question. Governor Baker, a Republican, has is doing what almost every governor before him wanted to do, and that is he wants to gut the MBTA. He wants to make it work. Uh, well, that's right. I, when I say gut, I mean he he's asked for resignations. Uh, the, you know, the trains didn't run. Haverhill people who really, the last stop on the Haverhill Reading line, as it's called, couldn't go to work. The what do you think of the governor's job, and what do you think of the MBTA? Well, he's got, I, it, there are some, some bright uh, spots here. The legislature has said they will look at certain things. I know that... Uh, uh, Representative Dempsey's uh, uh, Ways and Means is reporting out uh, uh, a, an exemption from the Pacheco law, named after Senator Mark Pacheco, which basically says... Not related uh, to our purchasing the, agent. The, uh, right. No relation. <laughs> and, but Senator Pacheco's bill, which uh, was put in to protect uh, those that might want to exploit, uh, you know, the public workers, and say we can do it cheaper, and it's never cheaper. You, the, the, the highway guys came in under uh, Bill Weldon, Paul Salucci to take over the highway departments. Of course, they used all the equipment and wore everything out that was already there that we had paid for, and of course, then they bill you for everything after. So nobody's going to do that unless they make a lot of money, and they did. In the case of uh, the MBTA, it's just total mismanagement, and they're protected by the legislature. The legislature doesn't allow uh, the uh, governor, uh, I don't care what governor it is, uh, to really do the reform they needed. Nobody seems to be working down there. We had a situation uh, over there that uh, a guy uh, was a bus driver. He uh, was uh, went over to the bus yards where his bus was, didn't take his bus, and he was drinking under the, you know, it was probably... Uh, uh, cocked and staggered into a bus and went for a joyride. What city council is this? No, no. He, <laughs> he was a bus driver. Okay. He, drives, he drives over to Cambridge, not even in Boston, drives to Cambridge and drives into uh, the Charles River off Memorial Drive. And then the family sues the MBTA. <laughs> we had a, the MBTA of the state, or taxpayers, paid $2 million. You know, you, you know, didn't who represented us in the courtroom. Yeah, Nobody ever showed up, that's the problem. And there was another situation, and I'll say, and this fellow is uh, passed on, uh, was gonna be fired 
So he said, well, I'm going to retire in September. And they said, no, you've got to retire in July. So they retired him, and he sued him for age discrimination. No one ever showed up at any hearing that the guy had. And Very interesting. He was awarded $250,000. Amazing. That's the incompetence. And that's just a few things that I've seen it. You know, magnify that. Uh, All right. Now, something that I think most people aren't really plugged into, but I bet you, a seasoned observer of politics, might be. We have the Senate president saying he doesn't like having the joint committees outnumbered by the larger House, and so he wants separate committees for the Senate uh, so that uh, the Senate can say yay or nay to bills and not just as part of a, a group with the House. What do you think of this looming fight between uh, with Rosenberg and uh, I, DeLeo? I, I agree with the Senate. Uh, you, you have these 21 member committees, six members of the Senate, 15, and I might be off of a person, 15 members of the House. So they have a hearing, and the House is so now not reporting it out. Or we don't like the language. The House is supposed to be the lesser body, and it controls the show, right? Well, it'll control the funds. You know, your, your right. budget all, always starts in the House. House one is filed in the House, and, and that's, that's where all the money issues start in the House and go over to the Senate after. But uh, having a hearing, I... Uh, one of the problems is there's so many people on the committee, if you go to a hearing, it's lucky to see one or two or three, usually the, the two chairmen and some freshman that just got elected that thinks uh. they ought to go to the committee hearing. I think you'll have better uh, hearings, much more accountability, more visibility, and you know, there's nothing wrong with having two hearings. Have one in the House, let's talk about stuff, and then go over to the Senate. Maybe they've they're going to have a better idea, or they're going to be so. More so, you, willing so to you agree that we don't need the joint committees? No, I think we should go to single committees, and they all end up in in, in a conference committee in the end, anyway. In the end, so they're so still even, they're still even the joint committee uh, goes b before the branches. Well, they can amend these things in the two branches. It's like you must well have let but them the have Senate, their own committee. The Senate right now can't report a bill out if it's outnumbered by the House and a joint committee. Right? Twenty-one to six. All right. Which side do you want to be on? Everybody? I know it's interesting. Yeah. So uh, I hope this is not a sensitive question. Do you still have uh, lobbying clients? No, I don't do that anymore. I've reformed. You've reformed. <laughs> All right. Let me ask you this. Uh, a lot of people uh, have mixed feelings. Uh, I made a complaint a year ago to um, Secretary of the Commonwealth Galvin that a certain uh, former state senator had not registered as a lobbyist, but in fact was acting in that capacity. Uh, that uh, that. That former senator, current Methuen city councilor, uh, Jim DeJuga, was fined twenty-five hundred dollars. Was that just? You can tell me. Uh, I won't throw you off the show that fast. Probably should have been two thousand. A little too much. <laughs> no, I I think uh, uh, maybe he misinterpreted. I'm not sure what what the, what the issue was, but I know I I'm familiar with what happened. But it's a. Uh, uh, it's your responsibility to go in and register you, yourself as a lobbyist. It's a very simple process. You have to go to, now they have to go to school for a couple of hours once a year. To well, what, what, I, I what guess they the, shouldn't I, be doing. There are a lot of questions about that. Uh, we're a little late on the break. There are a lot of questions about that. And um, I guess one of the questions is how did the mayor of Haverhill get a piece of city council letterhead? To type on. Did you go up and get it to him? <laughs> uh, he, he, he rewrote Jajuga's letter and and Bob Scatamachi signed it. Uh, the one question that has never been answered, how did the mayor get a copy of city council letterhead? Is that uh, free to the public? Can I go up and grab some? Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> most of uh, Well, you remember the uh, the, the uh, the mayor has a key to the city council office, and the city council secretary works for the mayor, does not work for the city council. And we only have a secretary at the mayor's goodwill. He could lay her off or just have her go to the clerk's office or come to the mayor's office, and we'd have no secretary. So uh, he has access to that. And, uh, All right, so the the secretary uh, of the city council. I think he does have access. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying, is it appropriate that separate branches of government? Um, I mean, why, can the council go down to the mayor's office and use his furniture? 
when he's not there, we do anyways. <laughs> all right. I mean, I, okay, I give you, I gave you a tough one no, after right. all that. No, you, you, you need to work in order to make uh, the city move forward. Well, that's a lot of that's petty stuff, Tim. And I think you have to. Uh, uh, I think at the time, uh, Bob Scatamacher, uh as council president, was called by the mayor and said, "Look, we." I can't. I don't want to do this for some reason, and we need the council to do it. And well, unlike unlike if you some recommend people, recommend it. Yeah, they all recommend, and he didn't think he was doing anything well, wrong. Well, unlike some, unlike some people, I don't blame Bob Scatamaccia because it, to him, it's an innocuous letter. It says we don't support it, but we don't right. not support it. Right. It seems like an innocuous letter. What he wasn't told. And whether that's Jim DeJuga's fault or Jim Fiorentini's fault or his own fault, um, that this letter would have significant weight at the state level. I don't think he was told that. <laughs> okay. I, I did talk to him about it, and that, uh, and I don't. Even, I'm not sure that DeJuga or Mayor Fiorentini knew it would that be that significant. I don't think they really knew uh, how important that was in the process. That is. That letter went into the state, and of course, the the proponents of that site, they're the ones that magnified and made a big issue out of it. Let me say this on the record, um, because this is an opinion show, so I'm not doing strictly news here. Um, the voters approved medical marijuana by an enormous percentage, in Haverhill, I think of 64%. Correct. Um, so my view is that the voters said they want it, so there should be no question about it. However, I do think that the process was so clouded, and then the mayor was on the show last week, and I think he agrees. The process was so clouded with the Department of Public Health uh, that maybe this particular one, Healthy Farms, has some some uh, ans has some questions to answer. Well, I, I of course that's not a job to ask those questions. Well, That's the State Department of Public Health. Well, let me They're ask the you ones this. that are licensing these folks. They're I, the ones I, that have the resources, the money. They should be uh, holding their feet I, to the fire. More than 200 residents brought to the uh, city clerk's office for inclusion on the city council agenda a petition against uh, healthy farms. Now again, I don't agree with two-thirds of the petition about, listen, the voters approved it, that's bottom line. I do agree that there's some problems with this applicant. How come that never showed up on the council agenda? Uh, I would say that it, I'm not sure it was filed with the council. I, I don't know who filed it. Well, I asked, I asked, I asked City Council President. With the, I asked City Council President John Mitchison this question, and he wrote, "Well, the mayor pulled the mayor's item, so this was pulled." And I said, "Are they related?" And he wrote back in an email, "No." It sounds like the mayor told the City Council to change its agenda. Is that appropriate in this charter? Uh, it, it, <laughs> well. It, it, no, you're you're independent of him, but uh, they may he may have said, "Look, we're gonna." Was it a courtesy? I would say w accommodate me on this because I want to put together a formal committee. The mayor did ask me to serve on this committee. I'm not sure if I'm still going to be on it, but are you yeah. are you going to be testing the products? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll, I'll skip that. But <laughs> I do like the site they have way out by 495. Uh, I, uh, I think they wanted to keep it out of the downtown area. The people that want to go and purchase the their supplies will be able to get off 495, go right up to the uh, uh, is it Technology Drive? That's yeah, Computer Drive. Made a little, little that space street was that street was made when you were mayor, wasn't it? Right. I think they're uh, for Wang. Correct. <laughs> we brought them in. You know, Bill, I, I would probably ask you some of the tougher questions, but it's only because I've known you for more than 30 years and know that you're a straight shooter and that you'll answer them as uncomfortable as you might have been with no, a couple of them. No, one of the things that I mean, we talked earlier before, and we, we did a little bit of MBTA, but commuter rail, I think that's really one of the most important issues facing the city of Haverhill is having a real first class commuter rail system. Unlike the cannonball from Hooterville and Pixley I that mean, we have I look now. Today, I looked. I, I made a comment today to a friend of mine who was going to lunch and the MBTA commuter rail was going by and it had, it was going, you know, the car was, it was going backwards because it, the technology's not there to, or a place to turn. Look, we're on television. And 
the uh, I put a call in. I didn't want to surprise you, but uh, wow! Well, wonders never cease. Uh, we have been off Haverhill Community Television since Mayor Fiorentini appeared on the program, and just as Bill Ryan's about to leave, we're on. I think I'll stay a little longer. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you want to stay uh, after the news, Bill? <laughs> Even though I have a number of other obligations. This All right. Comes for us. All right. Um, well, okay. I just I want to talk about the MBT. I wonder yet, what though. that's okay. all about. You want to offer us a prediction, Bill? I mean, is there? Did you uh, wave a magic wand? Do you have certain uh, power and authority over Haverhill Community Television, or did someone literally just fall asleep at the switch? <laughs> all right. Very, very, very interesting, uh, Bill. Thank you. All right. So before we do that, um, B uh, Bill and Maureen are having their what? What wedding anniversary? Uh, Forty-seven. Forty-seventh next month. So we've entered Bill and Maureen into the cake contest for a uh, seven-inch cake, choice of vanilla or chocolate, from LBD Second Generation Italian Bakery, One Forty South Main Street. I'll take the chocolate. You like chocolate? If I win, so. All right. And just a reminder to folks, this hour of the Open Mic Show is being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. Do you know David Tibbetts? I know him very well. He was, what, uh, Secretary of Economic Affairs when you were mayor? Right, and he was, uh, he was very helpful to us when, when during my six years. A very, very smart guy, and... Uh, <clears throat> and he's done a lot. Whatever program he gets in, he, he's he's a very successful one. Uh, at uh, whatever he does. Who's your favorite governor? Uh, of all, at any at any time that you were alive and noticed. Paul Salucci. It. You like Paul Salucci? Yeah, he was such a wonderful human being, and uh, he was generous to Haverhill people. Yeah, did anything. John Garen got a job, and. Every, um, <laughs> that was uh, Mitt Romney that gave him a job. Oh, was it Mitt Romney that gave yeah. him a job? Okay. But uh, Paul Salucci... George uh, Deakin got a job under someone. Who? George Deakin got a job. Uh, that was under uh, Bill Weld. Salucci's so, so far so clean here, huh? He's, well, <laughs> he, he got plenty of jobs, but I'm not sure anybody famous in Havel got a job. All right. So, uh, but... Uh, uh, and, I, and I also like... Uh, he, he, he got beat up a lot, but... It, uh, Mike Dukakis and I were very friendly during my years as mayor. Is great to the city of Haverhill. Uh, you know, I, I worked with him on uh, when he ran for president. He was up here. I, uh, he knew he could come to Haverhill and not, even though I was a Republican mayor, I treated him with all due respect. Is a, he was very good to the city. If of I may be so bold, you were a classic Republican. That is out of the the Abe Lincoln cloth, <laughs> as opposed to the wacko Republican. If you pardon my <laughs> terminology, um, who are you really? I'm I'm the chairman <laughs> of the Republican <laughs> City Committee today. All right, but uh, I mean, are you? Uh, anybody wants to join, get in touch. We're looking for uh, new people. We have a great committee too. What do you think of the Trans Pacific Partnership? I, I, the, I, the, the secret one that if anyone in Congress mentions, it violates the classified uh, documents. I, I think it's very important because China is moving with their bank, their their worldwide bank, which they want to uh, they want to uh, uh, exceed what the, uh, the folks. We're really giving you an education tonight. Uh, they they want to exceed what the the, uh, the World Bank does now by uh, getting all of these folks to join their bank. Uh, I think we got to get into the, the Far East and the Pacific Rim. Don't you think it? Get us really involved and get these these uh, nations tied in with the U.S. Because but do you think it's going to hurt our sovereignty? Not at all. A corporation. We're in a worldwide economy. Is this that a is good no thing? More, it's a good because it's a good thing. We want everybody in the world to uh, to live at a higher standard of living, and that's the only way you achieve that. But uh, but our workers don't have jobs under these kinds of things. We only have. Four and a half percent unemployment here. That's pretty good. Oh, well, if you want to work at McDonald's or Wendy's, I, I, or the legislature, same thing. Tim, when I was young, I would <laughs> love to have worked at McDonald's. <clears throat> the uh, I always wanted a job in the gas station. What was your first paying job, Bill? Uh, I was down to uh, the Havel Country Club, doing uh, doubles, carrying doubles. Uh, I did uh, doubles in the morning. That's carrying two bags for two people, eighteen holes. Doubles in the afternoon. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, no cats in, in the old days, and at night 
two nights a week that have a uh, twilight lead, I forget what it's called, you'd carry for nine holes, two more bags. And I made $7. Of course, my mother said, put it in the bank, Billy. Don't spend it. And of course, I give it to him when you put it in the bank, $7. And uh, My first job at WHAV, yeah. I was paid $2.85 an hour. And when I asked for a raise, Ed Setlin said, why should I give you a raise when any kid your age will do it for nothing? <laughs> I, I, set up, I set up pins at uh, City Alley's and at the Pawtucket Club. There was always a need for pin setters, and they paid like for, a, I forget what it cost to bowl a string, but it was only like seven cents a string. That's uh, what you'd get, and you could, the pins would hit you, and uh, they'd, you know. Well, we're going to go to news. Bill, do you want to hang around? I mean, yeah. no obligation. Yeah. No obligation. All right. We're going to go to uh, local news with the WHAB News Director, Dana Esmo. Uh, national news from FSN, local weather with meteorologists from the Merrimack Valley who actually know what the weather is. And then we'll be back with more of the Open Mic Show and Haverhill City Councilor Bill Ryan, especially now that we're also on Channel 22. We'll be back. Open Mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 802. WHAV Merrimack Valley. WHAV is a not-for-profit service of Public Media of New England Incorporated. It's heard on 1640 AM, the web, at whav.net and participating cable television stations. Three members of the Haverhill City Council who are downtown business owners would be allowed to vote on proposed rate increases for paid parking under a revised plan from Mayor James J. Fiorentini. A proposal recently submitted on behalf of the Downtown Parking Commission and the city's parking consultant to increase paid parking rates by as much as 100% for on-street parking has been replaced by virtually identical rate increases. They are separated between, quote, Central Business District East Section and, quote, Central Business District West Section, according to Fiorentini. As late as last Monday, Fiorentini told WHAV's Open Mic Show listeners he hadn't yet made a decision on what to send to city councilors. You always want to make, you always want to keep your downtown uh, affordable. So there's there's always that balance, and I haven't completely made up my mind what to what to recommend to the council on this. The proposals would define the east side of downtown as streets and municipal parking lots, quote, within the central business district filed in the office of the city engineer that are east of, but not including Essex Street and Washington Square. End quote. An ethics ruling determined councilors Melinda Barrett, Thomas Sullivan, and Michael S. McGonigal would be prohibited from voting on the original proposal for the entire downtown business district. Under the new separate ordinances, the proposed fee increases and uniform enforcement hours for paid parking remain unchanged from the original proposal. Readers of a WHAV Facebook post last month largely condemned the plan. The council on Tuesday is expected to place the revised paid parking ordinance proposals on file for 10 days and refer them to the Administration and Finance Subcommittee as requested by Fiorentini. Police in Methuen are asking the public's help to identify a suspect who robbed two neighborhood stores, one at Knife Point, within a three-hour span Sunday morning. Surveillance videos released by Methuen police show a Hispanic male approximately 6 feet 1 inch in height wearing a black hooded sweatshirt, a black mask and latex gloves with tattoos on his hands first entering the CVS Pharmacy, 76 Swan Street, about 8 a.m. Sunday. Quote, the suspect handed the cashier money for candy. When she opened the cash register, the suspect reached over the counter and into the drawer and took some money from the register. The male subject then fled the store on foot and was last seen running towards Conduit Street, a Methuen police spokesperson said. About three hours later, the same suspect brandished a knife as he took cash from a register at Family Dollar Store, 40 Jackson Street, Methuen. Anyone with information is asked to contact Methuen police at 978-983-8698 or Detective Keith Frost at 978 983 
8709. Haverhill Police are warning residents of scam calls purportedly from the Internal Revenue Service. Residents have been receiving phone calls from area code 202-436-9603 with Washington, D.C. showing on call identification displays or area code 501-428-2489, said Detective Captain Robert P. Bastoni. Quote, the caller is telling citizens that there is a pending criminal investigation and that they need to pay fees immediately to avoid criminal prosecution. The same caller is also making automated recorded calls with the same info, Pistoni said. Quote, the Haverhill Police would like to remind citizens that any phone calls from people claiming to be the IRS are fraudulent and that the IRS will send you official notification via the U.S. mail for any correspondence. Citizens should hang up on the caller and, if concerned about the authenticity of a call or notice, should call the IRS helpline at 800-829-1040, he said. If in doubt, residents may call Haverhill Police at 978-373-1212. In local high school sports, no scheduled matches on Monday for the Whittier Tech Wildcats. Remember, WHAV is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Dana Esmail. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Kevin McAleese. Foreign and interior ministers from the European Union meeting in Luxembourg have vowed to cooperate more to deal with the migrant crisis developing in the Mediterranean. At least 700 people drowned in a single incident over the weekend, prompting widespread criticism from humanitarian groups over the lack of a unified European search and rescue mission. Our Europe correspondent Jack Parrock reports. The President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, has called the leaders of the 28 EU countries for an emergency meeting in Brussels Thursday. Southern European countries with Mediterranean coastlines like Italy and Greece have been calling for their partners in the northern member states to help them tackle the issue, as the migrants' destinations are spread across the bloc. The EU's foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, says an awareness of deeper cooperation is growing. We've talked about uh, other measures, intelligence cooperation, regional protection programs, but also the issue of destroying ships. The EU will try to engage with Libya from where many of the flimsy smugglers' ships are setting off. But humanitarian groups insist until an EU-wide search and rescue operation is implemented, many more lives will be lost. Six men from the U.S. state of Minnesota have been arrested after allegedly attempting to travel to Syria to try to join the militant group Islamic State. Our correspondent, Mary McCarthy, has more. The FBI says the six men had been trying to join the so-called Islamic State over the past 10 months by any means possible. Four of them were arrested in Minnesota and the other two were apprehended after driving from there to California. Authorities say there's a major problem with Islamic militant recruiting in the city of Minneapolis. Over the past year, several other residents have traveled to Syria to fight with IS. And since 2007, over 20 Somali men have also traveled from Minnesota to Somalia to join the militant group Al-Shabaab. A U.S. air carrier is being moved into the waters of the Arabian Sea as a result of the deteriorating security situation in Yemen. But it's not clear whether the USS Theodore Roosevelt will try to intercept Iranian vessels that are heading to Yemen to resupply Houthi rebels. From Washington, Simon Marks reports. It's a dramatic move by the Pentagon. The USS Theodore Roosevelt and another American naval ship are taking up positions off the Yemeni coast just as an Iranian flotilla heads to the country with supplies for the Houthis. But apart from saying the U.S. is concerned about Iran's continued support for the rebels, the White House won't say whether there are plans to intercept the Iranian supply ships. The move comes at a delicate moment in nuclear negotiations with Iran. So far, U.S. forces have not boarded any Iranian ships since the violence in Yemen began. Simon Marks, Washington. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Wave weather. I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with wave weather. Cloudy for tonight with periods of rain. Initially temperatures in the 40s, then rising a bit perhaps overnight. During the day Tuesday, mostly cloudy, breezy and milder into the 60s with a few scattered showers around. Slight chance at some thunder as well. Maybe a few showers Tuesday night back in the low to mid 40s. And for Wednesday, partly sunny, chance of a shower. Temperatures near or just a bit over 60. 
I'm Gary Best. Your next wave weather in 30 minutes. Still not sure when your favorite features are broadcast? Check out the What's On page at www.whav.net for complete listings. WHAV, Merrimack Valley. Open mic. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. This hour of Open Mic being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. Uh, My continuing guest is Haverhill City Councilor, I always want to call him Mayor, Bill Ryan, former school committee man, former state rep, Former jail master, did you call it? <laughs> Whatever it's called. All right. Um, Bill is staying on because, for, amazingly, I don't know if they just finished rewiring or, or s- someone woke up at HCTV. Uh, yeah, okay, folks, I am a little bit hard on HCTV, uh, partly because uh, we're volunteers here, too, and uh, none of us get paid to be here. And uh, I know that Haverhill Community Television is largely volunteer-run as well, and I do appreciate their efforts. Uh, But it's it's incredible to me that when uh, Mayor Fiorentini is on last week, they suddenly have to do rewiring. This week, uh, an hour and a half of the show uh, doesn't appear. I kind of wonder what that's about. I welcome a call in rebuttal from Haverhill Community Television uh, tonight or anytime, 978 374 1900. We've been having a rather spirited discussion with Bill Ryan, but now it's time to let the listeners chime in. On the line, you are on the open mic. I don't have anything relevant to chime in with. I just got on. I just started getting your signal. Yeah, I'm uh, just curious myself about, you know, I thought maybe they took the night off for the holiday, although they they have previously worked on Patriots Day. But, uh, Bill, do you know Brian Langlois? I certainly do. Very active in our community. All right, Brian, what's on your mind? I remember Bill from uh, the really old days when one election, when he... uh, running against uh, George Caceres and oh. one by one vote yeah. and uh, so there was a recount <laughs> all that oh that takes me back oh Bill what's your side of that story well it was actually uh, I ran against George twice once uh, he won the first time 48 votes and that was in uh, 73 and then in 81 I knocked him out of the prime ring and, and Lou Burton and who was also a one-term mayor. Lou Burton and I faced off in the final. All right, Brian, good memory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I did uh, want to get uh, one of the birthday things. Uh, you know, I don't want to get off subject for you. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, um, well, we, we welcome it. So what, uh, you want to wish someone a happy birthday or a happy this, anniversary for May? This is a, a May birthday to Fran. To Fran, that a male or a female? That's a female. Uh, Brian, I know you too well. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and what's when? When's Fran's birthday? I don't know. She said the end of May. She didn't say what. End of May. Happy birthday, Fran. Uh, Brian, now you may you may have missed this, but um, you have competition this month because uh, Bill and Maureen Ryan are celebrating their 47th wedding anniversary wow. in May. So we've uh, added their names to the hat as well. All right, Brian, how how have things been? Are you continuing to get contributions to the Brian Langlois Relief Fund? Well, I think they're slowing down. Uh. So time to remind people. Bill, do you know the sad story? Uh, and uh, let me reiterate for listeners, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Brian, uh, but Brian had a, 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 two, a 2014 like no one else. He, um, his boyhood home 
on, by, you might even have some comment on this as a city councilor, his boyhood home on School Street ended up on the city's demolition list. He already had a buyer, but for some reason the city insisted on putting the house on the demolition list. He lost that buyer, uh, barely squeaked through getting another one by the time it was settled. Now, Bill, when you were a, when you were mayor, you really were strong with these code enforcement efforts. But it seems to me your administration would have seen that he was in the process of selling the house and not put it on the demolition list. Well, I I think that uh, Brian needed some assistance. Uh, it's a wonderful house that he had. It just needed some upgrading, you know, and, and he couldn't do it financially. So that's what the federal program was all about. And he did live in a neighborhood that was eligible for that. So probably the, the community development block grant should have played a role here so that he could have stayed in his home, which he wanted to stay and his family did. So am I right, Brian? Uh-huh. So I, I think that's uh, well, in Brian's Too case, bad it didn't happen that way. And then his uh, his wife, who had multiple sclerosis, is also blind, uh, passed away. And then to just to make matters even worse, his life savings was stolen, including the safe it was in from his home. So uh, we've been. Uh, telling people about the Brian Langlois Relief Fund. Uh, for spelling purposes, you can spell it Langlois, L-A-N-G-L-O-I-S, and drop off a donation to any Haverhill Bank branch uh, and ask for them to put it into Tim, the fund. Tim, it looked like, when, that, when I read all of that in the paper, it looked like it might have been an inside job, somebody that had a key to the house or knew the whole layout, knew that he had a, his savings in the safe. It, somebody that that knew a lot, so I, I, I think if I was a detective, I'd start right with Brian's immediate. Uh, I believe circle. Detective Benedetti is, is doing yeah, that. Good. Yeah, he's, the, he's still working on the case. Yeah. yeah, I think it's somebody, Brian, that had been in there before and been in your house and knew exactly what was going on. Oh, and yeah. Took advantage of you. And, uh, and so he's still working on it. The chances are the 29000 is all gone by now certainly well that's too bad well if you went down to foxwoods it's <laughs> i've still never been there but he's either well don't go my luck no <laughs> nobody wins <laughs> uh, brian we don't mean to put you on the spot i just tell the story because that's i why. i think it's um uh it's a story that needs to be told and um, and we ask anyone who can, you know, pennies or dimes, uh, to contribute to the Brian Langwa Relief Fund at care of any Haverhill Bank branch. I appreciate that, Tim. Brian, you want to try our trivia question? We haven't put Bill on the spot yet with it. What is the trivia? Actually, question? I just showed him the answers. Now he's not allowed. <laughs> All right. To win a ten dollar gift certificate from Kimball Tavern Antiques. Uh, John Greenleaf Whittier used to frequent two New Hampshire towns. Oh, Na we're still on that. We're still on that. Name the two towns. And then name two locations that were named after John Greenleaf Whittier in New Hampshire. And all these four answers are actually related. And Marcel, a frequent listener, uh, had three of them, although she may not realize which three that she had. And so uh, this reminds me of the famous bowling trivia question. It took six oh, months. Please. It took six months uh, well, to Bill get a winner. He was a pin setter. <laughs> and, and Bill, actually, you would have—you probably would have won that contest because you—you you actually worked for one of them. The question then was name. What was it? Anyone want to remind me? Was it name fifteen bowling alleys? Oh, name eight well, bowling alleys. We started alleys. off with seven, eight. then we went to ten. <laughs> well, in the, the old days, there were bowling alleys everywhere. The the armory up in Canusar Avenue had two lanes. The Pawtucket I didn't Club. know that. Uh, the the building where KC Carpet is on Lafayette Square, yes. the French uh, uh, a social club, had two alleys on the fourth floor. I didn't know that. Uh, How about that? Third floor. <laughs> and, hey, uh, Woody, are you listening? They, they were all over the city. There were alleys everywhere. In the, in, during, there are still alleys, but they're not where you bowl. The clubs all had them. The, <laughs> all of the uh, the uh, social clubs, the fraternal clubs, all had a couple of bowling alleys. You could, and they'd hire a kid to set up the pins. You know, it's. Oh, they weren't electronic. Oh no, it was all 
Did you ever get hit by a bowling ball when you were a pin setter? Uh, right in the shin. <laughs> oh boy! You know, you had to sit in front of, right at the in front of the pits. You had two alleys. Were those you, the big ones or the? Uh, uh, candle pins. Oh, candle pin. And but I, the, the somebody that could really throw the ball, uh, the pins would come up and, yeah, that didn't hurt. You know, and I also worked in the shag field at Haverhill Country Club. I got beaned all the time. Now today you'd yell, "Who's your lawyer?" That's In those right. days, they'd yell, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always some good stories here. But, oh, the, yeah, yeah, the great uh, the great bowling uh, trivia fiasco. But at, uh, uh, my, d who won that, Marcel? No. Um, gee, I don't remember now. I don't remember either. There was also a bowling alley, uh, the lodge, two of them, one down in Riverside where the uh, market basket is. Yep, I used to bowl at that right. one. And they also had one up on... What was that one called? Plaza Lane. Plaza, Plaza Lanes, okay. Now there was another one up on, uh, which was uh, Pleasant Street, which is now, I guess you'd call it uh, Bailey Boulevard. Okay. Well, the old Pleasant Street. Oak and Pleasant became Bailey Street, right. which later became Bailey right. Boulevard. So That was Haverhill Lane. Right, and they filled it up full of gas and Somebody threw a match in there, and that was, it blew up. Right, it yeah, was a I disaster right off. They were losing a lot of money, and they had a. Uh, Are you suggesting fire. there was something suspicious? It was a very suspicious <laughs> fire. I was only a kid, and everybody said, you know, something funny about that building blowing up with, you know, uh, and burning down. But that didn't last. And those are two uh, the lodge balls. Uh, what, do you, what do you call them? Uh, uh, the ten, uh, ten pin. pin. Ten pin, ten pin balls. They they never really took off here. People like candle pins. Duck well, pins I, I were introduced here. They didn't go. All right. I'm sorry, Brian. I I bowled candle pin at Haverhill Lane on Bailey Street. That's my favorite. All and right. Anything else on your mind, Brian? I'm sorry. Don't forget E Light down on Water Street. Oh, E Light and St. Joseph's. Uh, you know, Bill. If you've been paying attention, you would have won the trivia contest and <laughs> saved us six months of grief. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> All right. All right, Brian. Anything else on your mind? Uh, you want to do one on pool rooms? Oh, no, 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 not really. Oh, Bill suggests one. Maybe uh, Woody wants to adopt this one. Pool rooms. What would the question be, Bill? Name uh, 15 pool rooms in the city. So there were at least 15. Oh, there were a lot more than that. I couldn't name, but they, they were everywhere. Colonial. You're right. Pool room. As a matter of fact, my great uncle used to manage that one. Really? See, Havels is, is this very incestuous place. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's related to everybody, and everyone has a relative. Look at Bill Ryan. He's had like four of the top jobs in the city. You know. <laughs> Still going for uh, president of the city council. Well, no, we do. We're not, you can't run for that. You got to kind of top the Oh, uh, I know that, but. Uh, All right. Well, you never know. You've come close. I think I've been on open mic too many times. Oh, yeah, well, we, we were kind of, well, I don't know, I don't know if I was tough on you, but I um, I asked some tough questions. Bill came through with flying colors. Uh, he, he's been through this exercise before. Oh, very, <laughs> very experienced. All right, Brian. Well, thank you very much for your call. Okay, and uh, I, I did get another computer, so I should be able to... Oh, good. You have a new computer. Okay, we're also streaming to Facebook now. Yeah, that's what uh, Nate was telling me, because I could not get you online tonight. When uh, Channel 22 wasn't coming through, I went to the computer, but uh, I clicked on Tune In, I clicked on Listen, I clicked on everything. All right, cause, well, it is on, on my screen, but uh, we'll look at that. But also try Facebook. Uh, we're going to try to we're going to try to keep up this uh, modern way of delivering yeah. video, even though we're a radio station. Right. <laughs> And uh, looking for support for the FM. That's right. You want to do our legal ID, Brian? Uh, your legal ID. Uh, geez, I shut my legal mind off a little while ago. <laughs> All right. Well, you're pretty good. W H A V L P Haverhill. That's 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 uh, we have a a, a suffix of L P. Uh, amazingly, that's uh, that's because Congress got involved with the legislation that created this class of license. Ninety-seven point nine FM WHAV. Very good. Okay, Brian. On that, we'll go out. How's that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, uh, Mr. Ryan. Take care. All right. Thank you.
All right, uh, Nate probably isn't surprised, but we'll skip the break. We have another call, do we? You are on the open mic show. You're on the open mic. Hello, how you doing? Hi there, how are you? This is Greg over in Bradford. How are you doing, Mr. Ryan? Very good, thank you. How are you doing, Tim? One of the things we were commenting over the weekend, uh, I'm a volunteer for uh, Boston 2024, which is the group of people that are trying to bring the Olympics to Boston for 2024. And one of the things that we commented on is I think you're going to see some rapid reform at the MBTA not only under uh, not only because of we had nine feet of snow in six weeks but uh, and that crippled the system but I think you're going to see a rapid reform because a lot of officials want to present Boston at a very positive light this area in a very positive uh, light and one of the things they have to do is a lot of federal money is going to be used to reconstruct a lot of the T the entire network it's going to bring a level of new scrutiny upon it and I like to think that this is just my comment and I'd like to hear your comments that the possibility of an Olympic bid is uh, giving a lot of weight to reform at the MBTA. Bill what do you think of that? No I, I agree with the caller in fact I uh, about a Whenever the Olympic uh, uh, bid story started, I mentioned to John Mitchison at one of the meetings, let's send a letter to the mayor to uh, put Haverhill on the list of communities that will support the, MB uh, the uh, Olympics. We might have uh, one of the venues uh, that would be compatible maybe on the river. I know Lowell is, you Lowell is, is putting in for the uh, the longboat, I think they call them, with all the oars and whatever. There might be some part of that program that we could be involved in tennis or something along that line. Well, well Greg has mentioned on this program before, uh, Greg, correct anything I get wrong here, but that there is this kind of, um, when people reserve hotel rooms, you know, Boston will fill up first and then uh, some of the suburbs, and then uh, actually there will be people staying out here uh, for some events. And I don't know if you've ever done this, Bill, but you go online, you try to find the cheap hotel room, and you go to hotels.com or one of these things, and you find something that's, wow, that's, that's pretty good. Then you realize you're 30 miles away from where you want to be. Well, they, <laughs> the, good, the good thing is that we've got lots of rooms during the summer at uh, the universities and co the colleges all around Boston, and uh, they will be made, opened up for this event. I think it's great for Boston. I believe the Olympics will want to come to Boston because it is such an exciting city. Not only its history, but just the makeup of the city. It's probably one of the most interesting cities in, in America. I, I don't. I think the only one that comes close is San Francisco, but it, to me, it's, it's nowhere as good. Uh, as Greg, if you'd like, I'm going to save a recording of that, and you can play it at one of your meetings. <laughs> but, but well, I, had, I think if. If I, Mr. Ryan would like to come to one of the community meetings and express that support, that would uh, be great. Well, I, I, I do think it's a great idea. I did ask uh, John Mitchison to send a letter to the mayor asking him to have a formal committee or uh, to communicate with the uh, Boston uh, committee. Uh, I, it didn't happen. He, I, I don't think he was interested. But uh, Who, John or the mayor? The, the, the council president. Mitchison. Okay. You know, and I, uh, I brought it up at the end of a meeting. Can we send a letter and show our support? But it's a, uh, uh, I think it's good for Massachusetts. Little things like the caller has pointed out, upgrading the MBTA. We need something uh, that we. So you think that would be a catalyst? Well, we uh, otherwise we're going to be very embarrassed if people come from all over the world and write on those junks that we're running. The cannonball from Hooterville and Pixley. That, that leave the Haverhill <laughs> every day with the poor commuters on there. When we should be going down the middle of 93 or 495 with monorails with the state of the art, it shouldn't take you any more than 15 minutes to go downtown Boston. Have you submitted your resume to the MBTA? Uh, I'm <laughs> no longer there. I can speak freely now. <laughs> okay. I have an old friend in Lawrence who is very much on maglev, working very much with maglev. That's right. I mean, any over there. There's so many great technologies available for us. There's no reason that Boston's only 32 miles as a crow flies or whatever. We should be able to get on a, a, a train and be in downtown Boston nonstop, or maybe one stop, in 
15 or 20 minutes or less. No, and then that would get people off the roads well, for now, sure. Now people that live in Boston, uh, people will uh, think about locating industries out here. You know, if they can bring people and get them back and forth, not be on 495. The, the, the backup starts up in Kingston, bumper to bumper all the way down 125, and all of the other roads coming into Mass, then on to 495. By the time you get to Boston, you, if you don't have two hours, or two and a half hours, you know, if you're leaving around 8 o'clock in the morning, forget it. All right, it looks like 8CTV mm -hmm. has cut us off now, so uh, Bill Ryan has to go. <laughs> no, but, well, but, uh, Greg, did you hang up too? All right, well, I think we took that call out, we, uh, shut off that button. All right, Bill, it's been a real pleasure having you on the program tonight. We hit about every topic one could think of. And, um, do it again. And uh, happy anniversary to you and Maureen. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, drawing the name. I guess it's next week. Next week we draw the winner of the uh, May Cake Contest from LBD's Second Generation Italian Bakery. This hour of Open Mic was brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. We'll see you again next week. Open Mic! Join Tim Coco live on the open mic again next Monday night at 6.30. The opinions expressed on the open mic show are not necessarily those of WHAV, its underwriters or affiliated stations. The open mic show came to you from the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom. It's 8.32. This is listener-supported community radio, WHAV. WHAV is the Merrimack Valley Specifica affiliate. Catch the wave! On the next Making Contact. Let's